Kia ora tato, and welcome along, haere mai, to Showy Ovu, a podcast where I, precocious Penelope Ashton, as my headmistress called me, have decided to thoroughly investigate the hormonal hocus-pocus and menstrual machinations that is menopause by talking to a series of wondrous women and other owners of ovaries all about their own journeys. As always, a reminder that I am not a doctor, though soon I could probably do quite well on a perimenopause pop quiz. But if you want someone that doesn't need multiple choice options, please see a doctor or specialist when seeking answers, patches, potions and pills. My guest today is used to machinations of a different kind, which is navigating the spills and intrigue in the corridors of power in New Zealand's parliament. She first became an MP in 2008, having been a tip-top sports person before that, by representing New Zealand as both a silver fern with netball and then as a black fern and a member of the team that went on to win the inaugural Women's Rugby World Cup in 1998. But she shot to super global stardom through a viral video of her cloaked in a rainbow jacket as Parliament rang out with song through a very moving rendition of Ho Kari Kari Ana to celebrate the passing of her private member's bill that legalised, finally, same-sex marriage in New Zealand. And it certainly made me cry. So please welcome True Wahini Tour, Lewis Wall. Oh, tēnā koe, Penny, tēnā koutou katoa. What an introduction. I'm... I'm really honoured to be here today to talk about a very, very important issue for us wahine. Absolutely, absolutely. I've got an even better introduction after that, so just stand (laughs) by for that one. Absolutely. So do you feel like that was your biggest achievement, passing that bill? I think that um, I've had incredible privilege in my life. I think the honour of representing your country, uh, firstly as a silver fern, so being selected and then the first time you ever hear the national anthem being played. And then when I was in the Black Ferns, I had the privilege of leading the haka. Oh, wow. Yes, and, and then I've had the privilege of serving New Zealanders as a Member of Parliament. So that for me, they are all about representation and also about using my voice, I guess, to reinforce our identity as a country and then to compete on an international stage and to be able to do that is, you know, that is the defining feature of my life. And I'm, I'm inc- I've am i been incredibly blessed because I've had parents and family members in my community actively support and encourage me to actually, firstly, I guess, have the dream and the belief that I could do those things. And then when I've been and, and got there, all I've tried to do is play to the best of my ability and to use my voice for to bring about good change in the world, which is marriage equality. And now for me it is talking about things like menopause and making sure that um, our needs um, are understood so they can be better met. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've had a lot of privilege as well. But yeah, there is privilege, but it's also um, steeped in hard work on your behalf. So it's not just about that. I think it's about your commitment and your drive and your pushing to succeed. So well done. Thank you. Don't diminish yourself around that. Now, um, so we had a, a wee chat in Parliament, as I do. You do that much more often than I do. I've never done that before, about menopause. So you invited me to come and have a talk, and you had a cross-women's group meeting, and we had lots of fabulous MPs. And, yes, congratulations to the male MPs, indeed, for turning up to that. So what was the motivation behind that? Well, isn't it interesting how worlds collide? And so I have to acknowledge you. You are a leader in bringing menopause to the public. And so I want to acknowledge your your voice um, and your commitment to doing that. And when I think about why we had that conversation in Parliament, I mean, let's all be very clear, it's been a very challenging year. We have had hardly any opportunity for discussions in our Parliament. The 25th of November, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but it's the UN Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And then there's 16 days of activism as we lead to the 10th of December, which is International Human Rights Day. And so for us, it was an opportunity as women to come together. We all wore orange that day, or most of us tried to, because Orange the World is all about providing hope for a world where we live without sexual violence. But I think for me, it also symbolises a world where we live, where our needs as women are met by Mm. the system, by the health system. And so the reason we had that conversation was the week before, some of us had gone to the UK High Commission for a breakfast, and we have opportunities to engage with the High Commissioner, and in this case, the Deputy High Commissioner, Sam Pass, and I arrived, and I was having a hot flush. (laughs) And it was bizarre, because I just could not. And then they opened the doors, and I just said, I'm having a hot flush. And Sam said, wow, we're just 
we've got an inquiry before our UK Parliament on menopause in the workplace. And I was like, oh, my God, really? And then she said, yes, and we have a policy. And it was from that, I guess, disclosure and then Sam kind of building on it, we decided to have this, take the opportunity where we had our orange day to also have a guest speaker and a breakfast. And you're right, we had 12 MPs turn up, including two men, Glenn Bennett and Greg O'Connor, and we have to acknowledge our men. Both of them post have just said, oh, my God, that was amazing. We learnt so much. How come other men aren't here? Why don't men know about this? And I'm saying, well, actually, we all need to, and this is the beginning. So that's how it happened. And, yes, you were amazing. And now everybody wants to do something more. Like, what more can we do? And we probably will leverage off the UK inquiry and I've since found out Australia have started an inquiry and it has very much been about the impact within the workforce because I didn't know but 900,000 women apparently in the UK have been displaced as they've gone through menopause because after working in in an area for say 20 years they've then had all these issues and some of them have been sacked yeah and fired because they've been seen to have been incompetent or They've had these behavioural issues in the workplace. And actually, underlying all of it has been the fact they're going through menopause and not not being appropriately supported in the workplace. There's no policies. And as you've already highlighted, GPs are not prescribing or well, actually diagnosing to prescribe to help women through what is a normal biological process. Yeah, and it's absolutely. now unacceptable, right? We've got to yeah, do something absolutely. about it. Yeah, yeah. And like, as as I've said before, like, I just was astonished when I was looking into the symptoms and going, how does no one talk about this? And I think it's interesting that it's what you've experienced. And as soon as you make one comment, people just want to talk about it. Women just want to open up. As I said, I did a poem at WOMAD about menopause and this woman came up to tell me about her dry vagina, just like that on the spot. So you you made that comment, Sam replied, and then here we are. And I think that is... And that, that's just a very microcosm that can turn out to a macro situation, which I think is fantastic. Well, well done you. Hooray. We, we, aren't we, we're all marvellous. <laughs> well, actually, I think we are brave in a way because we're happy to talk about it. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I've been astonished by people who don't want to talk about it. Mm. And then those, once you do talk about it, it's like everybody wants to talk about it. It's They've just been waiting and we need to, you know, the door needs to be kicked open and it all needs to flood out and all our stories need to be heard and we need to, as I said before, take some constructive steps mm. to making sure that, that we as women have access to the resources that we need to continue to be productive and mm. to manage the symptoms, which, you know, I'm having a terrible hot flush right now. <laughs> and, I, and I was going to say, I, I am very sweaty, but it's because I got out of the shower, I think. I'm not really sure. As I say, I don't think I've... I'm in it yet because for me it's not like a rush and then gone. I just get quite hot anyway so that I'm like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? But then some people don't get hot flushes and that's the thing for me. I'm aware of all these symptoms so I'm a little bit like, uh, I don't know what is going to happen to me. It could be I could be like Ella Henry and have one hot flush and then it's all over. You just yeah. you just have no idea. But knowing what could happen is, is the thing. But anyway, I have my longer introduction for you now. So we'll do that and then we'll get into your story. Absolutely. So here we go. Lewis Wall grew up in Taupo and is of Ngāti Tūwhari Toa, Ngāti Hina Uru and Waikato ancestry. She was just a little bit sporty, chosen to be a silver fern straight out of school at 17 and then six years later in 1995 she became a black fern and a World Cup holder. She was inspired by watching rugby with her dad and also probably inspired to tell those who told her that she couldn't play rugby anymore at the age of five to suck it. She has a certificate and diploma in sport and recreation and a master's of social policy and social work, I think. Sometimes all those letters after you get confusing, but very flashily educated anyway. And she worked in the health sector before coming onto the labour list in 2008, falling off in the 2008 election and then heading back in 2011 when she won the Manuewa seat. She has been incredibly effective in Parliament with LGBTQI plus issues, with sport advocacy, period poverty, transgender rights, safe spaces around abortion clinics, because of course there fucking should be, working on banning revenge porn, holding foreign nations with appalling human rights records to account, and basically being an outspoken Amazon for social justice. Even though that has meant horrific abuse, death threats, and intense pressure, even from members of her own party. In 2015, she married her longtime love, and recently she's been just a little bit menopausally. Uh, so yet again, please welcome Lewis Lauren. Oh, nice to be here. 
Do you feel proud about all of that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm proud I live in a country and as a woman I could play rugby at five, even though I was banned for a bit after. Yeah. But then where I see our Black Ferns have gone, our Black Ferns Sevens, winning gold medals at the Olympics and the professionalism of the sport, I am really proud that I am part of a legacy that have continued to build on opportunities for women. Yeah, and it must be because I remember at the beginning, I think it may have been that World Cup that you won and it wasn't even on the 6 o'clock news once. And I was outraged. I The thing, I feel it's quite funny. So I'm a staunch feminist, but I really, it's good that you're here because I haven't had anybody that's a sports person yet. <laughs> Because it is not my wheelhouse. I don't like watching sport. But it's so funny. I feel like when there's women's sport, I feel like I should watch it, but it's still sport. <laughs> so I don't like to watch it. But my husband loves it. My husband's been watching the Phoenix women and, right. and all that sort of stuff. And I just think that the new representation of it in the media is, is amazing. So that must be very gratifying and quite the change from when you were playing. Absolutely. And to be honest, I think it is about the sport. And that was always my contention with people who love rugby. If you love rugby and you're a rugby purist, you don't care. Yeah. And when we did win the Rugby World Cup, and the person who actually gave us the most profile was Paul Holmes. Oh, wow. He got captivated by what we were doing because there was this big write-up in the Telegraph and they talked about this, you know, this team that descended and how superb we were and all our skills. And like usual, we picked up on the international media's reaction to us. And it's quite interesting now. I think we're going through a bit of a, a tough phase as we move from kind of semi-professionalism and other girls actually being remunerated enough to prepare well enough. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty obvious on the recent European trip that we weren't conditioned to be able to compete against England and France. And we are hosting the World Cup next year, these huge expectations. And I think when I played, the system just relied on us individually to get ourselves organised. And most of us, yeah, I was studying, most were working, we didn't get any support. And you've kind of got a halfway ground now that still isn't fully supporting the women enough to get dedicate themselves to preparing. And, I mean, when you're having to juggle work and children and then fit in the training, mm. we're never going to be successful, not anymore. Mm. England particularly have pulled in millions and millions of pounds and dollars into making their women professional which means all they get to do is worry about training yeah I mean and this is what I've always said too because people say we don't put money into sport because it doesn't generate the sponsorship money so then people aren't full-time so then they aren't up to the same you know level as as other teams or even right. as people say oh as the men but you can just see it's such a cyclical thing it was like unless you invest in them they won't get like that then there won't be sponsorship and then you won't have more money and it's That's so right. clear and obvious <laughs> you know I just like shut up you know it just sort of makes so much sense but so they're on their way but we just need a bit more and it, well Paul yeah. Holmes is a fan of the the, the staunch Wahini tour isn't he like you know oh, it's true yeah it's amazing she, she is amazing so when they first got married I was like well, what is that about so but then she's had this sort of renaissance is this incredible academic so exactly and yeah. focused on, on mental health and well-being and yeah. um, obviously from my perspective proud wahine Māori with them kawai and learning to do so I have always appreciated that platform to be able to speak up and out about things. And yeah. I mean, very early on in my Black Ferns career, I usually was the designate. So I had to be the one who would speak out about the 3XL shorts and shirts. They used to give us rubbish at the end of the season. And it would be me that saying, where's gear that can fit us? This is really disrespectful. Yeah. Why are you treating us so badly? Yeah, wow. We're representing oh. our country. You need to provide yeah. us with more resources. So I seem to always have be that one. Yeah, right. But actually, I'm happy to be that one because mm. what I do know is that once I speak out or others speak out, we give not permission, but we provide a space for others who want to use their voices too. Absolutely. And for me, that happened with period poverty, for example. Mm. You know, that was a meeting of two of my principals and my Manurewa electorate. One of them wanted food for the kids. The other one wanted hygiene products. You know, and then when we talked about what hygiene products and then we heard all these stories then, I mean, the, the brave ones in that narrative were the young people who talked about having to use newspapers, toilet paper, socks, 
or stay home because they just didn't have access. It's their real authentic stories that actually then say to all of us in power, what are you going to do about that? Yeah, absolutely. How are you going to support them to, to remove that barrier so they can continue to go to school, continue to play sport? And it's not their shame. Actually, it's our shame as a society and not providing them with the resources they need and their basic resources and, they, and everyone deserves the basics. Yes. And, you know, that's why I see that you've made a sort of quite a, a big difference on grassroots level for a lot of people through that social justice work. And I mean, obviously, bills that go through Parliament affect me, but I've never had one that had such a direct effect on me because I'm a marriage celebrant. So as soon as that one came in, I was like, this is amazing. And I loved it. And recently I stayed with two men that I married on Waiheke. So I would like to thank you for providing me with cheap accommodation. <laughs> I've just made quite a few friends with people that I've married and I've just really loved that. And I've loved the celebration. At the beginning, particularly, it was people that had been together for 20 years, 30 years. Yeah. Two guys called Guy, I love that, that had been together for, I think, 25 years, something like that. And so people that have been consolidating these lifelong, absolute marriages and in inverted commas into a, a legal, and it's obviously not for everyone, it's not for straight people, it's not all for gay people, but for the people that choose it because it's about choice, it's quite bloody delightful. Oh, and, and that was what drove me at the end. Um, it was about when you're a citizen and you're a resident and you have a government that has a policy that is discriminating mm -hmm. and supposedly we've had separation of church and state, but actually not. Well, at the end of the day, it's not the state's job to say who you marry or where you marry, but it is their job to issue a license to any two consenting adults, whoever they may be, with a marriage license so that they can choose. That's what I fought for. And what I love about New Zealanders is that when you explain things in a very simple, transparent way, they're like, oh, well, what's the big deal? Yeah, and you just know that the new generation is sitting back looking at other boomers and some generation X just going, what the fuck? Who, who cares? Why, why does anybody care about this? So I think this leads in quite nicely to the first question that I've been asking everybody. So that is, what is your relationship with your body been like in your life and what journey has it been on? And I imagine like coming out and things like that are sort of linked into all of that. So Yeah, I mean, so I got my period quite early. Mm -hmm. Like I was... I was a 10-year-old. I think I was too. And yes. I remember getting my period. My mum used to call it her mate or our mate. Okay. And I remember there were times where, because we shared water. I don't know if anyone else did, but I remember four children and we'd had baths. Oh. I'd have my bath after my mum sometimes. But there were times when she said, you can't use this water because she had her mate. Right. And so if I had my mate, can't share the water. So I learned really early about being clean and she always used to have buckets and I know my mum won't mind but back then we weren't readily accessible period products so she had a bucket of I would say now rags yeah. old towels and things that she used to have and that was you know because I was born in the 70s and I'm happy to share but that's what we used wow. and my periods were really frequent like I used to ovulate every three weeks oh, wow. and so I had to go on the pill as like a 12 year old to control my periods. Wow. So did I have accidents when I was young? Yep. I remember playing soccer one day, wearing the white shorts and having mm. accidents. Mm. So I, I had to learn really early about how to manage my periods because I was playing a lot of competitive sport. Yeah. And was that difficult, like when you were on the world stage and things, or was that easily? Um, not, not once you, when you take the pill, to be honest, it does really moderate. And then when I got really fit, Sometimes I didn't menstruate at all. And the other reality for me, I know there are cultural issues about using tampons, for example. But for me, I, that was the best method of controlling my periods. I don't know about that. Oh, well, because of the insertion. So some right. young women do not use, they will only use sanitary napkins or pads. Right. I never used a pad. I just thought that was, I just didn't, I wanted, I wanted it inside. <laughs> No, and I mean, that, that remains an issue. I mean, there are still some young people from, well, women from cultures who don't. Right, okay. Because it's linked to presuming virginity and... Yeah, and purity and... and, and, purity that's and yeah, and that yeah. is still a challenge, I think, for some of our community. But again, we don't talk about these things. But through yeah. period poverty, I learned about it because I also tried to access the products that you can, the cups and... 
and wanted to run a pilot through one of my high schools. And that's when we got into all these little cultural dynamics amongst different Pacific and ethnic communities. So it wasn't just as simple as that. And is CUP considered an insertion? Yes. Right, okay. Right. And then I've always been in tune with my body, I guess, in terms of particularly rugby because of the contact aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But I used to love the feeling of when the body's been hammered. Really? And Yeah. (laughs) And I think, yeah, I did actually, because you learn the potential of your body through Mm. contact sport. You learn what you can do. And, yeah, I quite liked the dull ache after a really hard game because it meant I'd used my body. And, yes, I have had trainings in my lifetime where we've been pushed so hard that I've vomited. Yeah, so I have always, I guess, when I played, fully tested the extremes of what my body was able to do. So you enjoyed the power that your body had? Absolutely. Always mm-hmm. enjoy that. And so, yeah, sharing tampons and with teammates, if you found out you were, had it and you didn't have it, like, that used to just be normal. So I think in the sports teams I've ever played in, having periods and managing our periods was easy. We all just used to talk about it and share stuff. But this, when I've now transitioned out of sport, obviously, I mean, I stopped playing competitive sport when I was about 30. Mm-hmm. But in this whole menopause domain, I've not really had a sit around with people and talked about, as you've highlighted, libido issues, dry vagina issues. I suffer from this thing called paresthesia. Yeah. Now, for people who don't know what paresthesia is, it's when you you get tingling in your extremities. And for the last, gosh, six months, I've wake, I wake up in the middle of the night and I've just got wicked pins and needles. Right. And it's a symptom of menopause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, who knew? Who knew? Back a bit too. So did you know anything about menopause beforehand? No. No. And I mean, I even think, I think women have suffered in silence. Mm -hmm. And I think some women have talked to some women friends, but not in big groups. It's like, you shouldn't have to suffer, actually. And we should talk about these things and we should be finding systemic solutions to make sure that we're not disadvantaged yeah. going through this natural biological process after we've, many of us, I mean, I've not had children, but many women have and we've contributed to our societies by through via procreation and now it's our time where society has to mitty mitty and uffy and support us until we get out of it because apparently once you're through it, life then is... A box of birds again. Yes, you get your energy back. Some people have said. So now, did your mother? So your mother didn't talk about it. She didn't talk to you about it at all. Not, not until I've started talking about it, and I've said, "Hey, mum, did you suffer from this paresthesia?" And she's like, "Yes." And she used to have to sleep, and she sometimes she'd have to put her hands up, and really bad flushes, and really bad. Like I before I have dealt with it via a marina essentially going back on the pill, I used to have these floodings where blood would just, I'd have big issues about blood just coming out of me Mm. and needing to change and not being able to manage it with a tampon. And that happened to my mum terribly. Never told you about it at the time? No. Yes, it is crazy, isn't it? It's like, It's this whole other world that you just are astonished that has been deprived from talking about when it's such a basic biological function. And to hear that it was tried to be dealt with in the past with clitorectomies and things like that. Oh, I know. And lectures and... Yeah. And it's to say, what what medical ailment that afflicts man have they just tried to chop their dicks off about? You know, not too many, I imagine. No, but but I also think, for me, there's still the shame about everything to do with our wombs and our vaginas. And hell no, we've got to revolt and start talking about this everywhere and making sure it's in either legislation or in our health and safety policies or in menopause toolkits at work and that women are not disadvantaged through a period of their life where they possibly, I mean, there's lots of times we need support from the system, right? Mm -hmm. So it's when you're young and you need access to contraception it's when you, you may have fertility issues and we need access to clinicians, but maybe surrogacy services or services around helping us procreate. And then within that context, it's 
issues like endometriosis, and I've had that too, by the way. Um, what? Oh, and, and so there's this whole kind of lifetime of need that we have. And actually, probably if we were really serious, menopause is just one of the issues yeah. that we all need support for. But it's one of the issues that we all go through. Yeah, exactly. I've been very lucky with my periods, but I'm going to go through menopause. So to me, that's why it should be, yeah. all of that's important, but this is just something that everyone has. So why the fuck isn't there more about it? So that's how I sort of, you know, that's what's astonishing. Oh, about. yeah. And, and then I think we then all realise that we have a sexist, we have sexist systems oh, yeah. that don't meet our needs and they never have and they won't until we change them. Absolutely. It's just like racist systems or homophobic systems and this is what we're dealing with. But what I know is through the collective voices of women who share the stories and their authentic, real stories, we can change the system. And obviously for people like me, if we can, we must. So how did menopause start for you? Menopause started for me through that essentially flooding, just like the blood being so overwhelming that I couldn't control it. How old were you? I was 47 when it started. I'm 49. I turned 50 in February. Mm -hmm. And I kind of put up with it for almost, this is terrible, but almost a year where I just thought, oh, well. And then went to a specialist. Then I got access to technology that said, oh, you've also got cysts. And I've previously had an operation because I had endometriosis. And then I had a marina in and then it's from there that it's just whew. so the symptoms at the moment are mostly the paresthesia as I said the hot flushes I've had a few times where I've had heart palpitations but I've got a number of things on that on the list of 34 yeah and I won't go through all of them but it's yeah it's it's quite difficult because I, I still don't feel like I'm fully supported like, I'm not on hormone re replacement therapy, for example. You want to be? I'd like to some of the symptoms alleviate it. Mm. And so, you know, the next step for me is working with my GP to find out where I am. Apparently, there is a menopause test. Mm. Mm. It's like a and to find out whether I do need some estrogen and then in what form. So I'm still on the journey now of being fully aware of what is now available to me to help me better manage my symptoms. And how did you come to that? Like, so was it going to a, what What was the specialist? Was it a gynecologist? Or? I went and saw a gynecologist, but I had to have surgery. Right, okay. So, but that was sorting out that issue. Yeah. And I've had other issues and I've got, but not, a, oh, you have menopause and this is the full range of things that could happen to you. And actually this is a better way of A, diagnosing you and then B, treating you. So no one said that to you? No. So you've just self-diagnosed from doing your own research? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're at – Yeah. 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 <laughs> so when did you figure that out? Like when did that all fall into place? When did that – this year? This year, right. Mm -hmm. So why have you not gone on HRT yet? Because I'm still – I have read more about the research and the link with breast cancer. Right. And I've had a sister who's – recently been diagnosed with breast cancer right and so we've just gone through that process with her where she's had her operation she's had some radiation therapy yeah but I should be having these conversations with my doctor yeah but apparently this new sort of estrogen is very different to the ones that had caused that previously also it didn't cause it to the same extent that it was reported but apparently it's the same sort of as having two glasses of wine a, a week or something like that right. increase. But when there's a history of it in your family, you are right to be where it Because it's, it's not right for everyone, 100%. Yeah. Oh, and, I mean, and the other thing is we've been in this thing called lockdown and it's just been not – not that I'm not prioritising my health, mm. but I will absolutely engage – Mm. with my doctor and I've got a good doctor she's she's right. very responsive and she'll help me through it and I'm going to ask you some questions about actually given these symptoms I've had for the last couple of years why haven't you asked me if I'm going through menopause given you know I'm yeah. over 45 yeah exactly I turn 50 next year mm -hmm. mm. and maybe all these different symptoms when you look at it as a whole are symptoms of menopause. So yeah. and that will be fascinating and see what it will be. It is will what be. training she had. Did yes. she even does she know about it? That's why I think a lot of GPs, women GPs, have gotten to the age of menopause and suddenly had an epiphany for themselves and realized 
what should I have been saying to my clients up until now? Yeah. Absolutely. Have you found it has affected your working life at all? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, and, and the whole foggy brain where, you know, sometimes I've been in the middle of the sentence and I'm trying to think, what, 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 what am I saying? <laughs> or what fact? You know, they'll ask me and I'll forget someone's name or I'll be at an event and I, I'm like, I know who this person is, but I just, I, I'm having those types of moments. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I'm happy to, to share because for me, it was like, what's happening with me? But actually, when you know why, and some it must be stress related because when you're in a kind of a public situation and, and then you kind of just forget someone's name or what you were talking about. But mm. yeah, but, but not too badly. Right. Okay, and cool. actually, and also I'm happy to say, look, I'm really sorry. I've got menopause brain at the moment. Yeah. Like I did with the hot flash at the British High Commission. Yeah. I'm not ashamed of having, of being a woman, firstly, and then of going through menopause. Yeah. There is no shame in it. And mm. so if people need an explanation, so be it. Yeah. And I think that's it. As soon as you name it, then people know what's up. And then you know what's yeah. up. And then it's yeah. just like, oh, that's that. And let's move yeah. along now. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it's so not, I mean, it is a big deal, but it shouldn't be a big deal. It's like, just give me a moment. I'll just pop to the bathroom quickly. I'll be back. Yeah. Cope with the fact I'm sweating. So what? So yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And did you find any networks like amongst your friends of menopause or people? Have you talked about it to other people within your social groups? Yeah, they, we, we just started. So my wife and I, and, and to be fair to Prue, she's been going through this for a few years now, but she's been so contained about it yeah and not really and I mean some of it I've known because you get a bit moody but I've always been a moody person around my period oh okay but uh, yes talking to other friends now we're all in the same age group probably between what 47 and and 53 ish and yeah we're all starting to just compare notes and all flabbergasted that you didn't know oh no I, I just think I think we're all putting the dots together to be honest yeah and just now thinking okay so what can we collectively like what are the solutions yeah yes. you know, what things can help us manage the symptoms so interesting isn't it that your wife didn't want to talk about it like I would have thought that would be an <laughs> advantage of being in a same-sex relationship two women together to be able to talk about that stuff yeah not really I, I but I think some people were really stoic with their their own health and mm. kind of really private and I mean, I know she won't mind me just talking generally, but I just think it's about people's dispositions, Mm -hmm. you know, where they don't want to share and they're not happy to talk and they don't want people to know they're going through it. And I'm kind of at the other end of the spectrum now. One of the reasons I am is kind of the bigger voice thing again. And if there are systemic issues and the training is inadequate and if the system isn't responsive enough and if we're not getting what we're entitled to, then hell yeah, we need to, you know, rattle the chain and talk about these things because nothing will change if we don't make it change. Mm -hmm. Change just doesn't happen spontaneously. Change happens through a lot of collective work and effort and bringing to the attention of everybody these issues. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, we can sort the the issue out and find solutions, just like period poverty. Mm -hmm. And is there any tau Māori sort of thing around it that you're aware of around menopause and things like that? Yeah, I there are, but like even when it, so mati is what we called it growing up, but in some iwi, it's a rites of passage. It used to be a really big deal. As I mentioned the other day, like girl guides have now got a period badge. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah, yeah. How do we value young girls getting periods? And then as an entree to what that means in terms of their reproductive potential. We're at a bit of a turning point, you see, because all these things have been hidden, not talked about, mm-hmm. and now we're bringing them into the light of day. And rua tanga is what menopause is, because I asked my colleague, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta, so I said to Nanaya, what are these new? And so Rua Hinetanga is a really special time. It's almost like that time when you have fulfilled your potential as a procurer, as the wahine who provides tangaka, and then you, you're into this other phase of your life, which also is incredibly special and prized. And, and so I'm looking forward to exploring what that means. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because older women are much more revered in Māori culture than they are in Western culture. Yeah, I think they are. We get 
to a status where as a fire or as that you're, you are looked up to, that you do have a lot of knowledge and you're respected mm. as a queer or a kaumatua. Yeah, so, but I don't think, I mean, that's not easily accessible, is it? No, I mean, it'd be interesting, like the push and pull between, you know, the older and feeling invisible as opposed to your cultural roots and heritage and the, between the yeah. two, and like how do you navigate that? Oh, well, I think that's the age now. We're navigating it now and we're talking about it now and, mm. you know, hopefully people start writing about it who have this knowledge mm. and sharing it with everybody else. And, mm. Mm. and it's about the demystifying. Yes, and destigmatizing and normalizing. De shaming, if that's a word. Removing yeah. the shame. Yeah. Exactly. So I think we're still in that space where and that's why people don't want to talk about it unless it's with a very close group of friends, but not generally. Mm. So that's why what you're doing is so important, because you're just taking it out to the world and Yeah, I don't have a lot of shame. <laughs> <laughs> So it's why people can come with me on that journey. It's the thing about which I'm really appreciating that way. So is there anything else that you wanted to talk about at all around menopause? I mean, we've covered quite a lot or anything you were thinking? Yeah, about? for me, it's just getting it out there, what those symptoms are so that people can know really, like I wish I'd known two years ago. Absolutely. I, I, won't, I won't say I've been through two years of hell, but it's been really uncomfortable, challenging it hasn't been the easiest. Yeah, yeah. But I feel like there's this big light at the end of what, for some people, is a really dark tunnel. Yeah. Really sad to read that women get depressed, they get suicidal. And, in fact, in the UK, that's really kick-started it, where we have had a death of a woman. And then what's also sad is, like, her husband is like, I wish I'd known. Yeah. There were all these signs and symptoms. And to be fair, that's what one of my male colleagues said the other day. You've given me information that I, I didn't know about. Yeah. And I think how men and partners generally want to better support those people that they love. And yeah. so the information we're talking about isn't just for women. Absolutely. It's for all of us. And it is excellent that you're looking to get access for all for HRT because as I said when talking to Parliament, and as Carolyn Harris said, it's all well and good for middle-class women with access to the internet yeah. and information, but there's other women that are just stoically getting on like they always have, but whose lives yeah. could be made so much better if they had access to things. So exactly. good one on all of that and Kia getting that up and running. <laughs> yeah, and, and can I just note, it was a cross-party women's yes. group, so the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, and I, I kind of wear the IPU, which is the Interparliamentary Union hat, and I'm on the Bureau of Women Parliamentarians, but it is cross-party. So with Nicola Gregg from the National Party and Ingrid Leary from Labour, and we had Jan Logie there from the Greens, and Minister Tanetti was there. So I actually feel like the people who needed to be there were there for mm. us to take this forward as a parliament together. I mean, that's the beauty of the cross-party women's group. We find issues that we can get consensus on because yeah. if we all agree, there are no issues about getting it through the parliament. And that must be a very, because a lot of the time politics seems to be just bashing your head against a wall. So it must be quite nice yeah. to just know that you're making real change for women all over the country and trans men and trans individuals. So that must just be, yes. yeah, something that's very satisfying. Well, it is satisfying because then you just focus on the kaupapa. Yeah. Because politics isn't about the kaupapa sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, the politics is about platforming, it's about perceptions, it's about media coverage. So much about media coverage. Yeah, whereas when we all just agree on something because the kaupapa is something we all support, then there is no politics in that. We just progress, we find a solution, we all agree to it, we progress it, mm. we can get things done. Yeah, yeah. And you can yeah. get shit done. Um, yeah. well, that's one thing that because you're the person who's willing to make the noise and stand out and then you have copped quite a lot of abuse for that. So is that something you've just come to deal with in, an, in your own way? Has it calmed down since the marriage equality, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think marriage equality, I, you can't beat the level of vitriol and you're going to hell and yeah. people ring my office, abuse my staff, abuse me. You had members of your own party yelling at you in your office, I was reading. I have had members of my own party in my caucus yelling at me in my own office. Mm. Um, I think it's hard because obviously you're the person who's leading it, but actually a lot of their um, rationale has got nothing to do with me. Mm. Like it's not personal. Right. This is what the Bible says or this is what they've been taught or whatever. So, 
you try and push it to a side and, and you go, well, I'm not taking your crap. It's not mine to own. You've got your issues. Go and sort them out. It just gets a bit much at certain times. Mm. Like usually you can cope, cope, cope. And then for me, the tipping point was that Christmas. But I can lock my front door and stay in the haven, which is our home with my wife and have family come. But I literally didn't leave because I didn't want to go out into the public. So I think everybody's got a point where you just don't want any more data input. Yeah, You just want to just relax and and have a time where you're not having to deal with anybody else's emotions. or And I think a lot of politicians these days, unfortunately, have got a lot of hate and abuse. And I just call it abuse. It is. And I name it and I say to people, you're being abusive. Yeah. And actually it's quite interesting because when you call someone an abuser, actually people don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And they actually do back off and go, oh, I didn't mean to say it like that. And I'm sort of like, no, what you've said to me is abusive. I'm not taking your abuse. You can have it go away. I'm not going to engage with you anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, because I'm not one of these people who think all politicians are pigs at the trough and they just want to go in for their own aggrandizement and all that, which is obviously nonsense, but it's so pervasive. It is, yeah. And obviously there's some people that are like that, but you generally go in there because you want to make a difference and make some people's lives better and or make people's lives better due to your philosophies. But then to be vilified for that and, to, you know, I was just looking at bloody Gallo's pictures directed at Jacinda and all this sort of stuff currently. I take my hat off to you because I'm not quite sure that I could cope with that on such a regular basis. Yeah, but I think everyone has their why and everyone has something that drives them. And I think for me my why has always been – when you find yourself in a privileged position, actually you have a responsibility. For me, I have a responsibility to wahine, to wahine Māori, to our takatāpui whānau, and then to then to Indigenous peoples, and then to people who are marginalised and minorities, so I can advocate for people with disabilities or those with migrant, you know, so... If that's what drives you and and you do feel that sense of responsibility and then it's about how you use your voice, actually I all that abuse does not detract you and f- and in my psychology is the more abuse I get, the more I'm committed to doing it. Yeah, well, it's like Oscar Wilde. You know, it's better to be talked about than not talked about at all. So if you're actually being talked about or complained at, you're making a difference and you're visible. Well, here, here, because that type of ideology is what drives me. I think for other people it might make them stop mm. and they reach a point where they can't do it anymore. Mm. But for me, it just makes me feel more like titanium. <laughs> I will never be broken. <laughs> <laughs> because Megan Woods is a friend of mine, so and I've talked to her about stuff, and she's like, "Oh, yeah, well, I, I just don't care about it." And I was like, "Oh my god," because she gets so much hatred too. So yeah. it is. Uh, it's particularly obviously. It's usually a lot more hatred directed towards the wahine. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Totally. and it's usually too about what we wear. Mm. We're, we're overweight. Mm. We don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. Blah 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 blah, mm. and. Yes. You do have to be pretty focused and have a resilient resolve and thick skin. about getting shit done, as you've said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, because of the clarity, though, on what needs to be done and how it needs to be done, you just, for me, it's just every morning, one step at a time. Right. And you progress through the processes and you answer all the questions and. And, I mean, I use evidence all the time. For me, it is about the evidence. It is about now understanding how many New Zealand women are displaced in our workplace, yeah. how discriminated have women been. And, I mean, as I said, in the UK, there have been court cases where now women have taken their employer to the court and been found against because they have discriminated against that employee who's been loyal and served them for years and years and years and then all of a sudden the performance has dropped but it's because of and what have they done to ameliorate that so I think they're looking at and that's been from a disability perspective I mean I think for us our Human Rights Act can't um, discriminate based on sex, age, disability I do think that the you know health and safety legislation that all employers have a duty of care to their employees. Yeah, so I mean this for us is not clear. 
there are laws that may apply, but I think what the UK is doing and what Australia is doing is do you need a specific law? Yeah, right. And I think for us, it's a good time to get involved. And I'm all for leveraging off the hard work of the Poms and the, and the Aussies <laughs> and making our legislative system fit for purpose. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is, it is inspiring to see something happening in the UK Parliament that's positive right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By the by, the Women and Equalities Committee, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So they have a committee dedicated to women's issues to bring about equality. Yeah. So we don't have that. Yeah. And maybe we should. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's that cross-party stuff, indeed. Yeah. So now, did you have a fun fact at all, an out-of-the-box menopause fun fact to share with everybody? Oh, yes, the fun fact. Well, apparently the first kind of dissertation around menopause was written in 17... 17- 10 but we it was termed a disease yeah and so I guess from that perspective yeah we were we had this disease and as you've highlighted there were all these solutions that were horrific yeah you know we all had these wicked toxins they had to get them out of us I mean I didn't know about the the clitoris issue and I mean honestly yuck but the leeches and the different methods and so wow yeah you know and I think in some spaces that's still where they see this right that it is a disease yes rather than just a natural life yeah it's like, yeah it's the last taboo it feels like because periods obviously are getting much more coverage now and you've helped with that pregnancy and maternal leave and things like that have been legislated around for quite a while and but yet the older woman thing just no don't worry about that so it's great that that's changing exactly I, I mean I know that's not a real fun fact well the other thing was that paresthesia I mean who the hell knew that the pins and needles yeah and so that's all I could find I'm afraid I know others have found juicier that's good that's good and I've I've been amazed that we've hardly doubled up at all so this is pleasing and somebody else had that it felt like spiders running around on their head wow yeah crawling under their skin and yeah the same so it's obviously to do with the nerves nerves being affected by the lack of of estrogen estrogen is this incredible that like that shit's amazing estrogen what it does for our bodies so exactly yeah Okay, well, thank you very much for that. That was all fantastic. And have a Merry Christmas. Oh, well, we're actually recording. This will be going out after Christmas. So this is Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year. Yeah. 2022 being a little bit better than 2021. But every time we say that, shit gets worse. <laughs> so, I know. It's like number here to 2022 is going to be the most amazing year. But I actually, I think 2022 is going to be an opportunity for us to show how resilient we've been. Right. And how um, not compliant, but we will now live in this new world. Yeah, yeah. And we want to live in that new world positively. Yes. And happy. So we will scan in, and we will present our vax pass, and then we will be free. Yes. And all the children will get vaccinated, and then hopefully some other people will change their mind, and we'll see what. All of that. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, my love. Well, happy New Year. Thank you very much. And who knows? Maybe we'll you. crusade next year together at some point. Sounds good. So have a fabulous New Year and, and we'll see you then. <laughs> Bye. And that was the fabulously fit, feisty and social justicey Louisa Wall, MP for getting shit done. And watch this space as to which shit she gets done, which sounds wrong. But menopausal changes are in the wind and not just from an aging digestive system. Do you know what? It's funny. I used to be so prudy about anything to do with that sort of bodily function, but then I have developed diverticulosis and I am distinctly less so. But enough about my colon, back to menopause. So that was the final episode in season one of Showy Ovaries, my first ever podcast, which was born of lockdown boredom, but really an incredulity at the array of menopausal symptoms that slam into our lady parts with seemingly absolutely no warning. And to that I say, fuck off, fuck you, and the times they are a-changing. I have made contact with two menopause New Zealand groups, one Menopause Over Martinis, which is on Facebook, and the Menopause Awareness and Action Community on LinkedIn. Yes, despite trying very hard for a decade or so, it seems I have been sucked into LinkedIn. But they are great resources and also have a wondrous communal sensibility that you can tap into. It's, I've just found them to be really welcoming and just so committed to getting the word out there as well because, again, 
couldn't believe that they didn't know what was happening to them. So again, the best way to get more information out there to more people is to share this podcast. I am coming back in 2022 with season two. But before that, there's going to be a bonus podcast, which will be the Showy Ovaries Live at Bats. And this is going to be recorded on January 28th as part of Listen to This Live Podcasts Festival. Tickets for the show are available now at Bats with my special guest, the hilarious comedian, Samina Zaira. If you felt like you wanted to help contribute to the continuing of this podcast, then head along to my Patreon, and that's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. So if you Google that and showy over is, you'll find me. And hello to Virginia McCabe for suggesting I literally spell that out. She's one of my greatest fans, so hello to you. And thanks heaps to my existing Patreon heroes and sheroes. Also, like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Hey, give me five-star reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you want. And look out for my shows coming up at the beginning of the year. Olive Copperbottom at Q Theatre in Auckland, maybe, Omicron permitting. And an adaptation of Sense and Sensibility that I wrote is on at the Court Theatre in Christchurch in April, which is also very exciting. Finally, a great big thank you to the women and one trans man who have shared their stories with me. You are the wind beneath my stay-free wings. So to Pinky, Anjum, Tusiata, Jennifer, George, Shirley, Anna, Ella, Michelle, Carolyn, Jane and Louisa, you are my estrogeniuses and my testosterone homies. And to my husband, Matt Harvey, who has learned way more about dry vaginas than he ever dreamed of, to you I say, you're welcome. So happy new year, one and all. Here's to 2022 being less of a dumpster fire than 2021. Here's to resilience, kindness, less ridiculous selfishness, health, happiness, and as Pinky says, lots of juiciness. I've been Penny Ashton, signing off season one of Showy Ovaries. See you next time. Kaki te anam.